Hi folks and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So this is part two of a two-part series that we're doing for a user requested sample uh, where the user sent us some samples and asked, why don't these run in my sandbox? Uh, why they're detecting my virtual machine somehow, why aren't they running? So in part one of the video, which I'm gonna link below, we actually unpack the sample. And then this part two, we're gonna actually look at what the VM detections are in the sample. So the way we left off the last video was we actually had an unpacked sample and that's where we're starting this one. Also in the last video we showed an example of running the sample in our virtual machine and we showed that when we ran it it actually just shut down the virtual machine immediately so that's a good place for us to start uh, when we start looking for how this sample is able to detect the virtual machine because we know what the behavior is when it detects the virtual machine it shuts down the virtual machine but that's a known behavior that we can identify in the binary and then we can work backwards to try and find where the checks are that actually triggered that behavior so I've done some uh, googling on MSDN here and uh, we have this system shutdown functions. So these are a bunch of uh, functions that you can call to shut down the system. These are API calls. But I did a little bit of further Googling because these are kind of high level calls, high level API calls. And remember from some of the other videos where I talk about hooking APIs in order to detect behavior, we really want to hook as low as possible so that we capture as many API calls as possible. So if possible, we'd like to get a hook in the uh, NTDLL layer, which is one of the, the lowest user land layer before we get into the current so I did some more Googling and I found uh, NT shutdown system, which looks like one of the lowest API calls in user land uh, used to actually shut down the system. And I'm going to actually hook uh, this NT shutdown system because I think it's going to be a little bit easier to trace back up the uh, call stack until we get into our uh, into our binary. So let's take a look at our binary and we'll talk about how we set this hook and what the binary looks like. So we'll open it up in IDA here. So here's our uh, binary. This is where we left off in the last video uh, with the binary open. So it's a PE file. And I figured the first thing I would do before I go about setting hooks on like NT APIs, probably just look in the imports and see if there's like a shutdown import. It's probably the best place. I mean, maybe they actually imported it and they're going to use it so we can find it in the code. Now you guys probably know the answer to this. It's probably, there is no, uh, no shutdown call. So there is a shutdown API call here, but it's for WS232, which is the uh, internet DLL used for internet connection. So this uh, API call has nothing to do with shutting down a system. It has to do with shutting down the socket connection. So it's not the right shutdown. So they weren't silly enough to import a shutdown command into their imports. So they're probably dynamically resolving it, uh, in which case my uh, first idea to actually set a hook on or a breakpoint on anti-shutdown system is probably going to be the right way to go. The way we have our debugger set up today is the way that we pretty much always set it up. We're going to use uh, IDA's debugger and we're going to use a XPVM here as our target host. And so we have IDA's remote debugger set up here. So let's pop back to our IDA instance and we'll set a breakpoint on start here just so that we can break as soon as we enter into start. And then we're going to set up the debugger to use the remote debugger here. Let's do remote windows debugger and we'll set up the process options with the host name an octet ending 131. It's already set up here. Okay. Now we can run and we should stop on start. Okay. So now that we have our IDA instance running, we have the DLLs loaded here. Just let me set up the view so it's a little bit easier to see. So let's uh, hop into, these are all the modules that are loaded or DLLs. Uh, here's ntdll.dll. So I can double click on that. Control Control F to find uh, NT shut down system. So there's the API that we want to hook. I'm going to add a breakpoint on it here. And then we just run until we hit the breakpoint because we're pretty sure we're probably going to hit it. Okay, so we have an exception here, but I'm not too worried about this exception. I'm going to try and just pass it back to the application and continue running and see if that's a problem or not. I'll actually explain why we got this exception uh, a little bit later on, but for right now, we'll just continue as, a, as normal. Continue, and I will pass the exception to the application. Okay, and now we've hit our breakpoint on NT shutdown system, so we know we've triggered the VM detection and now the malware is trying to shut down the system. So let's look on the, on the call stack here for uh, NT shutdown system. Remember the first argument on the stack is always going to be the address that called this function. So we can see that it is actually this function in our code here. Let's copy that out and I'll just press G and go to that function. Okay, here we go. This is in our code here. This is in our PE file. So we do a get module ntdll.dll and then we do a get proc address for NT shutdown system. So they dynamically resolve that API just as I suspected and then they uh, call out to it somewhere, I guess. So what we wanna do, we don't wanna shut 
shut down the system. So let's label this uh, name shutdown system. Then we're going to stop our debugging because we don't actually shut down the system. And then we are going to look for that function in our function list here. So control F shut down system. So here is our function that we just saw in the debugger uh, that was being used to call shutdown system. Now what we want to do is want to trace the references to this function and find out why was this function called? Because whatever called it must have been the thing that detected whether there was actually a VM present. So uh, let's just do xrefs. We're in win main. Okay, so it calls it almost right away. So here's our call here. And then we looks like we have a check and a jump. So what are they checking? They're checking AL. That's the low byte in the EAX register. And the last thing is this function here. So with standard call functions, the return address is returned in EAX. So they're checking EAX to check and see whether there is a zero or a one in there. And if there is a one, then it jumps to shutdown system. So this looks like our VM check here. So let's name this as maybe VM check. And let's uh, take a look at it. Okay, so we jump into this maybe VM check. And remember, whatever is returned from here is going to be the flag. So if it's a one, it means that they've detected a VM. And if it's a zero, it means they haven't detected it. And the reason why I know that, again, is because the uh, register EAX was checked for a one or a zero. And EAX is the return register that the return value is stored in for a standard call. That's actually just kind of work backwards here. So here they return. So where's EAX here? So it looks like this here is what's being moved into AL. So let's name that bar VM detected. So let's see where that's set here. So they do a set Z uh, on this flag here. So there must be some sort of VM check here. And it looks like, yes, they move a zero into it here and they do a set Z here as well. So what set Z does is it actually sets the register if the zero flag is set. So you usually see a test and then a, so here's the test here. And then if the zero flag is set from this test, then they'll set a one in this register. And if the zero flag is not set, then they set a zero in here. So it's basically a way to turn a check into a Boolean flag set zero or set one. So here we can see this is where there's a one VM check here probably because they're doing the set set here. And then there's one VM check here. So let's take a closer look at what these VM checks actually are. So right away, I see something kind of strange. Now for you guys, this might be if you're not uh, super familiar with assembly, this may not look strange to you, but to me, this looks like an assembly instruction that I've never seen before. Well, actually I have seen it before because I know this VM detect, but before I understood what this VM detect was, I did not know what that instruction was. So uh, what we can do is we can actually Google that instruction and uh, it's kind of clever what it is. So let's pull up our Google here. Here we go. So here's the instruction here and it says it's used to detect the presence of virtual PC. So the way this works is the virtual processor for virtual PC actually interprets this instruction this assembly instruction correctly. So if it's run, that's that's interpreted as a valid instruction. Of course, that's not a valid instruction for normal processors, right? So if this is run on a non-virtual PC processor, the processor is not going to know what that uh, instruction is, and it's going to throw an exception. So the way that this works is you call this opcode, and uh, if there's an exception, you know that you're not running on virtual PC because it wasn't interpreted correctly by the uh, processor. But if there's no exception, then you know that you are running on virtual PC because it actually understood this instruction. So it's kind of a clever tell. I will actually link to this site below and I'll link to a few other interesting documents on uh, detecting virtual machines. Uh, a lot of these are actually quite well known now and very well documented. So the fact that we see that little check there, uh, if we pop back into our IDA instance, so we can see the check here. And then what they're doing is they're checking EBX to see whether the exception was thrown or not. And then if there was an exception, uh, EBX is gonna be uh, all apps or whatever. If there was no exception, then EBX is gonna be zero and then the set zero flag is actually going to set this flag here. So that's the way that works. So if you're running on virtual PC, you're going to have to actually null this out somehow. And we're going to talk about patching this in a minute. But just keep in mind that this is a uh, VPC virtual PC detection. Right, and then the second place where we saw that set Z where they're actually setting the flag here. So they move zero into it and then they set it down here. And why do they set it? Well, they compare EBX with this value here. That looks like it has some ASCII characters. So I'm gonna press R and turn it into a string. VMX, okay, this might be a string. VX, VMX, okay. So I know what this detection is, but I'm gonna walk through how it works uh, anyway. So this is, a, this is like a backdoor 
store for VMware. And I believe it was actually documented in the same site here. VMware backdoor. Yeah, here we go. It's the same one. So the way this works is there's like this special uh, read from IO port command for uh, VMware. So you can actually set the IO port to be VX. And then you pass this magic number in register EAX. So you put in uh, VMX into EAX. And then what happens is when you call this command, it'll actually return in EBX the VMX string. So again, this is a case of assembly that under a, on a normal processor, this wouldn't be interpreted as anything. The processor has no idea what this is. But there's a special segment of code in the virtual processor in VMware that actually understands this code and will interpret it correctly. So if you look at the IDA instance here, they're actually doing this verbatim. And then of course, if EBX has that string VMX in it because the uh, VMware processor has interpreted these instructions, then we know to set the detection flag. So again, we want to patch this out as a VMware detection. So we'll need to patch this section out as well. So we have two checks in here, one for virtual PC and one for VMware. And then of course the results are put into AL, the lower bytes of the EAX register. And then we saw before that if that if EAX is set uh, with one in it, then that actually triggers the uh, shutdown of the of the system. So what we're gonna need to do now is patch these things out. Now, it's kind of tricky. I mean, it's not tricky. It's just, it's time consuming if we wanna patch these things out. But I'm gonna show you a trick that that's gonna definitely help speed up the patching. So let's go back to uh, where this VM check is called. I'll jump to xrefs here. All those checks are done in this function here. Um, and again, none, you know, the only thing that comes out of that is this AL, uh, this lower byte in EAX uh, that's being tested. And then the jump not zero is being done to determine whether uh, if it's set, it comes down here to shut down the system. If it's not set, we jump into the rest of the code. So really, if we wanna close all those checks off and stop all of them, all we have to do is just patch a single byte here and say, uh, you know, jump never or jump if it is zero or whatever you want. You just want to change this um, flow so that it jumps here always. The way to do that is uh, we probably have to pop over into text mode and then look at the opcodes and then we'll have to actually patch those opcodes in the binary. So let's pop over into text view here and then we're going to do our trick where we want to actually show the operands and the opcodes. So we're going to go general number of opcodes is eight, please. And so that's just gonna show us the actual hex binary uh, that makes up these assembly instructions. And what we're looking to do is we're looking to patch out this jump right here. So it's only two bytes and we could replace those bytes with knobs. And then you see, we would just, instead of jumping up here to shut down the system, it would never jump and we would just always go to the next instruction here and we would completely get rid of that entire VM check. So the way to do this is uh, to just because it's only two bytes is just do it live in a hex editor. I have a video on this on how to patch with a hex editor. I'll link it below for you guys if you haven't watched it, but we're just gonna use the same technique that I showed you guys there. So the way to do that is I have the binary loaded up here in my hex editor, and my hex editor has this searching function where I can do a uh, binary search. And what I'm doing is I'm doing a binary search for this binary string, so AD8570 FEFFF, and there's only one hit for it in the binary. Where I got that from is right here, these hex bytes make up this assembly instruction and that's of course the next instruction right after that 75 ed now you might be wondering like why didn't i just search for 75 ed well that's only two bytes and it's probably pretty common so i'd get a lot of matches in this binary and i wouldn't know which one is the correct one but because this assembly instruction is nice and long i only have one match and if i double click to go to it in my binary here i've matched it here and you can see the last two bytes before that instruction are 75 ed 75 ed which is the jump that we want to knock out so we can just uh, click here and just do 90 90 and so that puts two null bytes here and we'll actually save this as a uh, different file and uh, and then we'll take a look at that in IDA as well so I've saved that as blob2 deck patched here and let's take a look at that in IDA here Okay, so we've opened the uh, patched version in Ida here, and then we have to take a look at that uh, call to see whether we've patched it out correctly, that jump. Now, how to get to that? Well, since this is actually just the same binary as the one that we were analyzing, we just take a look at the offset here and, and jump over to the offset. So let's just grab this offset here. We'll go to our patched binary and uh, press G, go to it, and uh, here we go. So we can see here is the function 
I think that's the function that, yeah, that has the shutdown in it. So it's completely isolated. Here's our call to the VMware check here. Uh, so here's our, our VPC check and our uh, VMware check. But if we go back, you can see that the results from that call, see here's the test, they're completely ignored. And we have two knobs that just completely knop out that jump to these functions up here. So there's no way that we're ever gonna shut down the virtual machine. Even if we detect the virtual machine, uh, we're just gonna knop right through it and continue on with our execution. So there we go, uh, fully patched binary. I'll also upload this binary to Malshare and I will link to it in the description below in the video in case you guys want to take a look at this patched uh, version. And to the person who sent the sample in, uh, the Beckab, Beckab, <laughs> sorry, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce the username. You can actually use this sample now in your sandbox and it should run. And hopefully this two-part series has shown you guys how to go from, it doesn't work in my sandbox, it's just shutting down, to I unpack the sample, I get the payload, I identify the reason why it's not working in my uh, sandbox or my virtual machine and then how to patch it out. So hopefully this is kind of a, a good uh, tutorial that puts it all together for you how to go from it's not working to now it works and I can actually run it. So uh, hopefully this has been interesting. Keep those uh, requests coming. They're they're super awesome and uh, I really like doing these, uh, these good questions uh, for you guys. So keep the comments coming and keep the requests coming. Uh, it's, it's super awesome. We're always interested to take a look at the samples that you guys send us. Also, thank you to everyone who is sharing our videos and spreading the word. Uh, thanks to everyone who's subscribing. Remember, if you're not subscribed, to subscribe, turn on the a little bell so you get the notifications one tutorial video every week hopefully we'll keep this up and uh until next week keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware and stay curious